Now, uh, Matt is uh, actually no stranger to these conferences. In fact, he presented the first one way back in April and uh, was at the time he actually he presented a, a long pick then as well, which has done quite well. Um, that was actually, uh, it escapes me right now what, what, what it was. Do you remember what it was? Um, yeah, it was Valet. Va yeah, Valet, which is up about 100% or 1,000, it's, it's up quite a bit. So about 125% from? 125%, so if you listen to that, if you're signed into that conference, and, and I know there are some people who, who were, and who have been with us uh, throughout the year, and, and obviously we appreciate your your business, and and um, but anybody who took advantage of that then has profited quite handsomely. So that's enough for me. Now, Matt, you have another idea to for us today, so you can go ahead and take it away. Let me know if you need to uh, if you need to have me do your presentation. Oh, there you go. You got it already. Okay. Perfect. You, so everybody can see that. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for the time again to speak with you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dive right into it. Um, tell you a bit about the firm and then uh, exactly what it is that um, that we're talking with today on the contrarian side. So Delbert Capital is where we're located in Vancouver. Canada. Sorry, sorry, Matt. Sorry to cut you off. Are you able yep. to blow that up so it's presentation mode, just so it's a little more visible? This. Would I go full screen somehow? Uh, well, it might, yeah, I think it would. Yeah, you can zoom to actual size. There's a way, to, it, it's okay if you can. Does that work? Yeah, perfect, yeah, okay. Better? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there we are, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, disclaimer, uh, I'll, I'll let, let your, uh, your listeners read that. The typical disclaimer that will come uh, with regards to uh, our firm and any of the uh, securities that we talked about today. I'll tell you briefly about Delbrook. Uh, we are a material specialized hedge fund uh, based in Vancouver, Canada. My background was uh, previously with Fidelity Management Research Company, uh, managing cyclical equity exposure. Uh, we run portfolios um, of materials uh, equities, uh, best defined as long short equity, uh, really falling into three strategies. That would be relative value, event driven, and long duration. Uh, we have run these funds with net long bias. Uh, there's nothing in the mandate to to keep us uh, from having to do that. It's just you know been our view of the sector uh, over the last call it th uh, three to four years. Um, exposure ranging from you know anywhere from net long ten percent you know to you know very bullish times where we'll be about 50, 60 percent uh, on the net side. Um, so. Our funds have done relatively well. Uh, a, a quick promotion here, uh, you know, up, up, you know, you know, multiple times versus ETFs that we follow. Uh, really benchmarked to the uh, S and P uh, materials ETF and the S and P metals and mining ETF. Uh, <clears throat> so, what really are we talking about here? You know, we're 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 running these these portfolios with a net long bias. Uh, our our view of most commodities at the moment uh, is quite bullish. Commodities are coming out of a multi year cyclical trough. Uh, what's really driving that? It's a combination of a very robust macro picture for commodities. Um, specifically, what we're showing here is just the the, the annual growth of money supply um, <clears throat> out of the U.S. Federal Reserve since 2000. So take that as you know, just over 20 years, looking at about an 8% compound annual growth of money supply. Uh, most importantly, though, if you're looking at that chart, you know, look at the right-hand side and see what's happened just in the last year alone. Uh, for us, that really uh, spells out uh, long-term view that uh, the U.S. dollar should be in cyclical decline. That, from a macro standpoint, is quite important for commodities, um, you know, for commodity priced in U.S. dollars. Uh, more importantly, though, when we look at the fundamentals of most commodities, uh, you realize that the sector has been underinvested in, underrepresented, um, had, you know, marginal cash flow in the last decade since, you know, call it 2008. Uh, the end of the uh, super cycle for commodities. What that's resulted in really is cyclical, um, you know, uh, 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 pressure on the space, but lack of capital has been reinvested in, in the sector. Uh, in general, companies have not been able to uh, do one of the most important things, which is reinvest in the discovery and definition of further pounds of copper, pounds of nickel, you know, ounces of gold, et cetera. Uh, so that's depleted reserves and really put us in a position 
we think uh, where commodity prices need to go higher to make the existing or the remaining reserves uh, uh, um, economic. Uh, so it really is a story both on the macro front and on the fundamental front as to why the broad commodity space uh, sh should be on everybody's radar. Gold in particular is something that um, we've had a passion about in 2020. I'll tell you, as, as, as a multi-commodity um, manager, uh, gold is only one of the areas that we look at. But, you know, we think the, the stars are generally aligning for the gold tape, uh, both from, you know, a monetary um, a, a policy perspective, um, really, you know, looking at treasury new issues in the U.S., the amount of debt that's outstanding. Um, we're not gold bugs uh, per se, but what I tell you is that if, if, if there was ever a time for gold to work, we think the time is now. Uh, record deficits, uh, the chart on the right-hand side here really speaks to what concerns us in the short term. You know, you have 58% of treasuries in the United States that need to be refinanced within the next uh, three years. That equates just on a mathematical basis to uh, approximately $12, 12 trillion. Um, so we think really what's gonna happen here is longer term, lower rates, lower rates uh, because the treasury does need to refinance all this debt. Um, you know, those lower rates, you know, equate to lower US dollar, uh, lower real yields. And we think that's a very supportive in, uh, environment for precious metals in particular for the gold space. Um, really, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, the highlight of, you know, uh, our view on gold combined with, with, with uh, the previous slide, which was looking at just, you know, new discoveries and reinvestment in the space. The fact of the matter is we're not finding a lot of new ounces of gold out there. Um, discoveries are at, you know, record lows, uh, you know, leading to at some point um, shortages of production from majors, um, you know, who, 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 who've depleted their reserve base in the past. Where we're going with this really is, you know, one key theme that we've invested on in the last three or four years is M&A. Um, you know, corporate mergers, uh, large caps buying large cap, large cap buying mid caps, uh, solely to replace depleted reserves. We think that's a very important theme. You know, we've invested across the years, um, you know, uh, I, I think going on 13 or 14 companies that have been um, uh, subject to M&A. The, uh, the latest was yesterday. Uh, we had a takeout yesterday uh, of a company by the name of Premier Gold. So we really think that theme of large cap companies backfilling depleted reserves that they haven't replaced because of underinvestment is here to stay. That plays into our pick for today. Um, the pick for today is a company by the name of Torex Gold. It's about a, about a $1.6 billion company. Uh, trades um, on the Toronto Stock Exchange uh, is examining listings elsewhere. The real story for Torex is this. Uh, it's a large gold producer. It produces approximately 400,000 ounces of gold per year. The company has a single asset. It is based in Mexico, um, you know, high grade, high margin mine. Uh, the real story that we like with this one, uh, obviously people have heard the gold story throughout this year, uh, being quite topical in 2020, but really what you need to look at with Torex is the fact that you're investing in a company, uh, it's actually down on the year, which is surprising given uh, the price of the commodities. Um, so Torex uh, has had problems throughout 2020, uh, mostly COVID related. Uh, that that you know, uh, that's the result of uh, the lack of uh, the ability to get supplies um, into Mexico, uh, some operational issues, but really that is all behind the company, um, all, all behind the company because they've resolved that, uh, stocked up on what they need to continue to run. Uh, but what attracts us most to Torex is just the valuation. Um, you know, those who know this sector know that gold producers with reasonable margins typically trade in and around one times their net asset value. Uh, that's simply a discounted cash flow plug in your commodity price. We use strip pricing or flat pricing. Typically these companies trade at about one times net asset value. Uh, Torex uh, trades at, uh, at, at, at less than half its net asset value. So we see a good significant opportunity for Torex to re-rate on the back of uh, the COVID situation resolving itself, but also the operational improvements they've made throughout the year. What really impresses us with, uh, with, with, with Torex is that it fits the bill for a takeout. It's of significant size to make a meaningful difference uh, to companies who are looking to consolidate and to add production um, to their uh, to their story. Uh, in general, uh, I'll, I'll uh, forward on here to the thesis. Um, you know, it's trading at half the value of its peers. Uh, we think this this valuation gap will close in the coming months. 
operational improvements, uh, as well as restocking of supplies, et cetera, from the company have resulted in remarkable free cash flow. We generally uh, value these mining companies on a combination of net asset value, but also free cash flow yield. Uh, the company in the third quarter of 2020 produced cash at an annualized rate of a 40% free cash flow yield. That is next to unheard of in the mining space. And we think it's just a signal of what this company can do in the future. Uh, in general, we like Torex because of the valuation, because it's under most radar screens. And the, you know, the cherry on top of this, if, if we had to uh, you know, uh, 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 bring it forward, is that this probably looks uh, like a materially higher stock price uh, once tucked in or in the process of being tucked into a larger company. So sort of the trifecta for us, we love the contrarian idea of you know, finding assets that people don't pay attention to uh, that have significant cash flow, not only on the quarter, but something that we can see uh, maintaining itself in the next you know, three to five years. And the fact of the matter is this company will produce cash at a rate where it can likely you know, uh, uh, generate enough cash uh, as its market cap in the coming years. So we think the company is set to re-rate. Um, in general, we can see 50 to, uh, 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 50 to 60% upside uh, in the next uh, two to three quarters. So Nathaniel, with that, I will I'll leave it and see if there are any questions from your viewers. Great, thanks, thanks, Matt. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so this stock, by the way, does trade on the uh, on the pink sheets in the U.S. T O R X F, and yeah, year to date, it's down three point six percent. It sold off in February and March, along with everything else. Um, now, so so you're you're bullish now, and tell us a little bit. The the company has managed to also um, clean up its balance sheet a bit, right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, look, the company, like any company um, in the development stage, uh, you know, brings a, uh, an amount of debt on the balance sheet, uh, really not of any concern. This is one of the healthier balance sheets that you'll find in the mining sector. Um, you know, I think, I, 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 you know, to be completely full disclosure, there obviously have been conversations with the company about capital allocation going forward. Um, we founded and sit on uh, a shareholder gold council uh, with a few other hedge funds. Uh, to really focus on uh, capital allocation principles. Uh, one thing you know you need to realize uh, with a company such as Torax is, uh, you know, it's sort of the Cadillac of problems to have here. They've addressed all of their capital uh, uh, issues with regard to building a mine. Uh, they do have some development opportunities that will require capital, but it's all self-funding at the moment. There should be no requirement for further, you know, large debt increases, and we like that uh, given the outlook for gold is strong. Uh, but in general, provides us with a margin of safety in case things don't work out in the gold space. This company is completely self-funding right now. Nice. And you uh, have a target of this. It's currently trading around 19 Canadian per share, and, and you do have a, a target, uh, right? Yeah. I mean, the way we value these internally, um, we have fluid targets based on moving commodity prices. But, you know, in today's environment, you know, we think we could see north of uh, $27 for this stock. 27 oh, Okay. So it's an upside of about almost uh eight yeah 40 percent or so yeah. very interesting all right and you mentioned it was potentially could potentially be an m a candidate as well well look i mean that's not a thesis that we can invest in uh, yeah right you know uh by itself but you know we have had success on the m a side uh multiple takeouts this year last year um you know the, the general theme is simply uh companies are not reinvested in replacing depleted reserves Therefore, um, you know, they need to acquire reserves. Uh, free cash flow profiles, production profiles at large mining companies drop off a cliff in the next three to five years. Uh, it in general takes a company 20 years from discovery to commercial production for any asset globally. Uh, they're out of time or sort of at the 11th hour uh, if they want to address the production declines that are coming. Uh, therefore, you know, we believe the M&A theme is as strong as ever. Um, we can't time these things, but what we can do is find high quality assets with high quality comp uh, uh, high quality management uh, in good jurisdictions that will produce cash flow, uh, you know, and in the meantime, uh, you know, look for capital appreciation on the basis of fundamentals with the idea of, you know, this probably fits the bill at a much higher price, mind you, within a larger cap company. Right on. What, what about the price of gold? Like what if the price of gold were to drop, drop a bit? Um, can the company stay profitable at, at certain levels? 
Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll run you right into the slide right here, um, which is uh, right, right here. The chart on the right is the uh, cash cost, uh, as well as something called the all-in sustaining cost, which is the cash cost for us, plus uh, 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 sustaining capex to keep the mine running. You'll note uh, that this company, you know, peaks um, in 2020 uh, because some operational uh, improvements in capex that they made um, at just under thousand dollars an ounce. So, in general, here, you know, gold this morning trading at you know 1875. Um, this company is generating positive total margins, um, you know, up to about you know 900 dollars an ounce, going to 800. But on a cash cost basis, which really is sort of your short term downside. Uh, you know, that's, you know, below seven, uh, 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 below 700. So there's a significant margin of safety there. Mm, nice. All right. And then I had a question come in from uh, the audience about your past pick about the valet. So why did this um, go up more than hundred percent? I mean, some of it may have been timing obviously, and do, do sure. you still hold it? So valet for us was a story um, with multiple catalysts and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for multiple catalyst investment opportunities. Uh, Valley had a disaster in 2019. They had a tailings dam failure um, at one of their mines in Brazil. Uh, took out a few communities, killed a few hundred people. Very tragic uh, environmental disaster. Um, at that point, the Brazilian government uh, put like uh, um, a variety of, of, of restrictions on the company in terms of capital spending. Uh, basically, made them accrue up to five billion dollars. Uh, for restitution and for everything else that had to happen, uh, environmental liabilities. Uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, they've solved the issue with the tailings dams, reinvested, spent a lot of money there. Iron ore prices have been very, very supportive. Um, you know, they look to be coming to an end with regards to negotiations with the Brazilian government for environmental liabilities, you know, five plus billion dollars. Uh, but because of the overhang of these liabilities and questions around long-term development, uh, they traded at about half half the valuation of their peers, being uh, a company by the name of Rio Tinto or BHP. Um, so really, it was a value play focused on, um, you know, catalyst, that being uh, the de-risking of, of, of the liabilities from the tailings dam failure. Um, combined with the fact that, you know, if you dug into the product they were producing was a superior high-grade iron ore, uh, sells at a premium. Uh, the company, when we started looking at it, was generating, uh, in, you know, in excess of 30% free cash flow yields, um, you know, basically replacing its market cap um, every two and a half years. Uh, so yes, we still own it. Uh, the stock has moved materially. Um, we see a resolution on the horizon uh, with the Brazilian government's being the next real catalyst. Uh, obviously, the company's got more expensive. Uh, you know, the stock's doubled, but our um, iron ore prices are at multi-year records still. So you know, we, we still have comfort in that name. Um, we don't have it as the same concentration as we had before. Uh, and obviously, you know, this is a fluid situation uh, based on market dynamics. So, um, you know, that changes from day to day, but no, I mean, we're still supporters of it. Uh, we think dividends and share buybacks are just around the corner. Very interesting. Cool. All right. I see no more questions. Thanks so much for that, Matt. And, and uh, there you go. Great, great ideas uh, for you guys. And let me see here. Yeah. So maybe just before we do the next uh, have our next presenter, which is Christian Putz of ARR. I uh, just wanted to give a, a moment to shout out that we're remember, keeping in mind that you can subscribe to these events. You can get a subscription, which gets you a free event. You pay for four and you get the fifth one free. I know we have some people on, on here today that have already taken advantage of that. The next event is tentatively scheduled for February, I believe the first or second week in February. And information on that is, is available uh, on the website contrarianpod.com, as well as Breakout Point and Value Walker. You can just hit us on Twitter, or I believe you have my email as well, mattbaker at gmail.com.